Welcome to another edition of Inside Florida Dance. This week coming to you from the lobby of the newly renovated Lincoln Theater on Miami Beach, home of the New World Symphony. On today's program, we're going to take a look inside a ballet class. We have a great interview with Edward Valella. We're going to show you what's inside those huge dance bags that dancers carry on their shoulders. We go center stage with Ileana Lopez and Franklin Gamero. Our health segment covers massage, chiropractic, and rehabilitative therapy. We cover the dance calendar here in town. And we have some wonderful footage of Mikhail Baryshnikov dancing Twyla Tharp's choreography. That sounds like a good show. Can I stick around and watch this? Sure. <laughs> Stay with us for a look inside Florida Dance. someone who has only been involved with dance for the last four years, every opportunity I get to see dance, the more I see it, the more I learn to love it. You're going to love this segment, because we're going to go inside a ballet class. Every ballet class begins with a plie. A plie is a French word, which means to bend, but not just to bend. It has a very special way to bend. The knees have to be over the toes. The uh, hips have to be over the knees, and the shoulders have to be over the hips. It's a very distinct way of looking, and it's a very good exercise, and every ballet class all over the world starts the same way. We would like to demonstrate some of the positions that you can do a plie, a demi-plie, and a grand plie. Ladies, please. Music. The preparation begins with the arms. One and two. A demi-plie. Demi-plie, that means half of a plie. So the knees are bent only half as much as they could, and then they have another demi-plie, forcing the insteps to develop the strength in the foot and leg and lowering. And then a grand plie, grand, grand, big, large plie, and arms. And another grand plie, and six. This is the first position that you use in class, and this is the second position, legs apart. Watch the arch. The arch has to remain lifted as you plie so you don't press in on the foot. Good. And one. And in steps up and rise to the top. Now I mentioned that the knee has to be over the toes. Knees go out over the toes. Good. One. So you don't buckle. You can strain the knees or strain the ankles. One. Other grand plie. And then we transfer to the next position, which is used is the fourth position. One foot being placed in front of the other. Still the demi-plie and another demi-plie. The sh shoulders is right over the hips. You shouldn't be twisting to one side. The hips are always directly front. One, the most difficult part of this is to coordinate the bending of the knees, the use of the arms, and the use of the head all at one time. It seems so easy when seen in a ballet class or on stage. These things are practiced two and three classes per day. And the last position, the most difficult position, is the fifth position, a tight position. One foot crossing over the other and the legs being crossed at the thighs. And a nice tall pose in the fifth and follow with the head. And the last grand plies and two heels down showing the demi and up and another grand plie you pass through the demi halfway down and you finish and come back to first position and lower the arms great after that we have a numerous amount of exercises which we'll explain in another time and that's the class for the plies thank you ladies take a break did you enjoy that, Owen? I really did. It was very interesting, and I can't wait for next week's segment. Super. For those of you in the audience who have little ones, our good friends at Little Rock Productions have put together a learning ballet coloring book. They also make sweatshirts that are learning aids as well. They have all of the steps, all of the various positions. You can get this book free just by writing in. Later in the show, we will put it on the air for you. That's so cute. <laughs>
Next we have Owen interviewing Edward Valella, the artistic director of Miami City Ballet, at the Miami City Ballet Studios in Miami Beach. Your initial success over the past few years has been duly noted. What I'd like to know is when you have a minute, if you have a minute, what do you see for Miami City Ballet five years from now? Well, I think the most important thing for us is to keep in mind our purpose, who we are, what it is that we intend to be, where we've been, how we're going to get to the next step. I've taken the premise that we are a classical company, but classical in the 20th century. We are a contemporary classical company. Um, what I did was I took a year and a half to lay the foundation, to raise the front monies, raise the visibilities, develop audience, and so on. Then we took three years of production to lay our artistic foundation. Now that I think that we've got that, we can make these further reach outs. I think it's very, very important for us to make a comment on 20th century classicism. What is going to bring us into the next century? Mm -hmm. And I think there are two or three ways to approach that. One is that we will continue with the best um, work done, master work done in the 20th century. But I think it's incumbent upon us to do original work, to um, to stimulate where, seek, search out where this art form has yet to investigate and where it can go, still keeping in mind our tradition and looking back. So we are extending into the 20th and the 21st century, but keeping a reminder that we are in um, a, a tradition that was born basically in the 19th century. How large a company do you see five years from now in, the terms, of, in terms of dancers? I think it's important to stay in contact with our personnel. And I think that once a company gets over 40 dancers, it's very, very difficult to give each dancer individual attention. I think that's been one of the keys to our uh, early embrace by this community is that each of our dancers, when they step on stage, know exactly what they're doing. So I think 40 is the good place to be. However, we'll be doing a nutcracker. We'll be seeking to do larger work, so we'll need additional personnel. In September, I'm going to start an apprentice program. And I hope out of that program that I can get an additional dozen people that we'll work with for a couple of years. And they'll get to know us, we'll get to know them, and then we'll take them into the company as time goes by if both sides are comfortable with that. So that would give us the opportunity to have 40 dancers plus access to another 10 to 12. And I think with 50 to 52 dancers, I think we can do almost any ballet that we would intend to do, whether it, it's a 19th century spectacle or a 20th century and or 21st century uh, neoclassical work. Tell me, where are these 50, where do you see these 55 dancers performing in five years? Well, uh, that's, that's one of the, the areas of, of um, consternation, shall we say. I sometimes get a little uncomfortable with the politics that I find in South Florida, the politics um, of art and in particular, a building facility. Uh, my great concern now is if indeed we will have a new facility. I think that our growth is such that we are, we are prepared to do larger work. But if we don't have the stage upon which to put that, especially here in Miami, it's going to stifle us. It's going to limit our growth. And, and that, I think, would be a terrifically negative situation. So I certainly hope the politics and the finances and so on pull themselves together so that we can have a pr proper facility for both ballet, opera, and symphony. All of us in the arts community feel the same way. It really is frustrating. I've lived here many, many years, and I've seen this, this episode, this changing episode over the last 10 or 12 years. I hope they finally have their act together so that we can get you a proper home. Not that we have good places, but not the kind of places that you need to stage the success. Uh, I, I read with interest that uh, just about 37% of your budget is raised from ticket sales. Where does the rest of the money come from? The rest of our funding comes from what we like to refer to as broad-based support. It's everything from uh, major corporate funding to foundations to governmental to individuals to uh, various groups such as our ballet guild, our toes organizations. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we have major donors, but uh, if you have one or two major donors, if they get a cold, we're going to get pneumonia. So uh, again, broad-based is the proper idea. Also, it keeps us from thinking elitist. 
Um, plus, I think this is something for the entire community. We're aiming it at not the, the elite of the community. This is not an elitist idea. So we would like uh, full support from the entire community. And that's something that I think is a very, very important thing to get across to this community, that simply because we have been very, very successful in terms of our artistic product, our audience development, and our success on stage, uh, does not mean that we are comfortable financially. We have a, a substantial deficit, which is, which is typical of any emerging organization mm -hmm. or any existing organization. But I think it's very, very important for our community to understand that, again, we don't want to be elitist. We don't want to charge $100 a ticket. We want to charge what we do so we make it accessible to everybody. Therefore, we need uh, across the board community support. Edward, thank you for your time, continued success and growth, and we look forward to you into the 90s. Thank you. I look forward to it as well. Thank you. Tammy, I've always wondered what goes in those dance bags that all of the kids carry around. Well, now we're going to find out. These are my shorts that I carry in my dance bag that I wear on my way over to dance. And this is my sweatshirt, in case it's cold out. And these are my pink point shoes. And this is my black point shoe. Where's the other one? There it is. And these are my shoes that I wear on over to dance. And these are little pants that I also wear during dance. And this is one ballet shoe. And this is my other ballet shoe. And this is my hair stuff. And this is an ace bandage. And this is a belt. And these are some of my school books because I come some days right from school. This is some makeup, and I have some petroleum jelly in here that you put on your teeth during sometimes in performances so that you can keep your smile. And here's my hairbrush. And here's an umbrella in case it's raining. And here's a towel in case you're sweating. And Here's some sewing stuff in case your tights rip or your leotard rips. And here's some hairspray. And here's some toe pads that you put in your toe shoes in case your feet are hurting you or you have a lot of blisters. These are corn pads in case you have bunions. Um, here are some tissues. And... Here's some tape that you might want to wear around your feet, just in case you have some blisters. Another small tape. And here's some food, some fruit. Some juice, and some juices. And some peanuts. And some tuna fish. And that's what's in my dance bag. Well, now I know what's in those dance bags, and I can't believe how that little Kelly Cabrera manages to carry that dance bag around with her. Next, we go to center stage, profiling local dances. Tammy is with Ileana Lopez and Franklin Gamero. We're here with Ileana Lopez and Franklin Gamero, who are principal dancers with Miami City Ballet. Ileana, what is your training and what's Franklin's training? Okay, um, well, I was born in Valencia, Venezuela. And I started my dance studies when I was 10 years old uh, with Nina Nikanorova, Russian teacher. Um, I started there for eight years. We also got, had like guest teachers from the Bolshoi and Kirov Ballet. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was still in school, we both went and competed uh, for the fourth international ballet competition in Moscow. And we became finalists. That was like already a big step for us. Um, I was 17 then, Franklin was 18. 
And right after that, we received scholarships uh, from the San Francisco Ballet School. And we studied there for one year. And we used to perform with the company and stuff like that. But our first uh, full membership was with Cleveland Ballet. We were there just for one season. And um, after that, we received uh, soloist contracts with Berlin Opera House. So we went to Germany, to Berlin for two years. And then we moved on to Dusseldorf. Mm -hmm. That it was uh, Paolo Bortoluzzi was directing there. We worked there as soloist also for a soloist for one year and then as principal dancer the next year after that. But then we heard about Miami City Ballet, <laughs> that it was, you know, working pretty good and stuff and we wanted to work with Eddie, with Edward Villela. So you like dancing with Miami City Ballet? Oh yeah, I love it here. It's really great. And uh, we wanted to try to work on Balanchine because uh, we had never danced Balanchine before. Do you so, feel like you've like conquered Balanchine? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. It's hard, you know, because um, I was trained Russian technique for eight years. And you know you have to change the whole thing. Um, but I'm trying. I think I, I improve a little. We do too. <laughs> thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Since dancers are the super athletes, Owen and I felt that it was important to show you three different looks at rehabilitative therapy. On this week's show, Dr. Neil Meyerowitz will show us what a chiropractor does. I would like to begin by answering a question which I am often asked, and that is, what does the doctor of chiropractic do? The doctor of chiropractic uses the time-honored methods of consultation, case history, physical examination, x-ray analysis, and laboratory analysis. In addition, the doctor of chiropractic provides a complete structural examination of the, of the body which centers on the spine. It is this structural examination of the spine which differentiates chiropractic from other healthcare procedures. The spinal column or vertebral column is a series of movable bones which begin at the base of the skull and ends in the center of the hips. Although the spine is composed of 24 movable vertebrae, it functions as one dynamic organ. There are seven cervical, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar vertebrae. In between each of the vertebrae is a fibrocartilaginous disc which helps to reduce shock reduce friction and, allow, and allows movement. The 31 pairs of spinal nerves extend down the spine from the brain and exit through a series of openings between the vertebra. The nerves leave the spine and form a complicated network which ultimately influences every living tissue in the body. Alleviating the irritation to these spinal, to these spinal nerves and restoring full spinal mobility is what the chiropractor provides to his patients. Don Rocco is a certified athletic trainer with Miami Rehabilitation Institute, a branch of the Health South Network. Today, she works with Lizette Piedra, exploring ankle flexibility and basic strengthening exercises. Okay, Lizette. What I'd like you to do is start with our flexibility exercises today, okay? The first one I want to show you is with a towel. You just roll it up, take it in your hands, and place it below the ball of the foot. There you go. Pull back nice and easy, and you're going to stretch the back of this muscle here, which is the gastrocnemius muscle, okay? Don't hyperextend your knee. Pull nice and easy, hold for 10 to 15 seconds. The same exercise can be done with a bent knee. Bend the knee, pull all the way back, and that's going to stretch the lower muscle, the soleus muscle, okay? Can you feel that? Yeah, much more than the other one. Good. Okay, stretch the leg back out again. Now we're going to do a little bit of strengthening, which is the alphabet exercises. Pretend you have a pencil in the, between your toes, okay? And you're just going to do big capital letters, A, B, C, and get through all those exercises that way. Go all the way through the alphabet and back. The more resistance, the more strengthening. Perfect. Last exercise I want to show you today is with a piece of TheraBand. This exercise, you just take a piece that I'm going to give you to take home. You tie it up, place it over both feet. You can also do this at home at a dresser or a couch. Pretend this is the dresser or the couch that you hook it onto. Turn the ankle out. Very good. That'll help strengthen these. Now, you don't want to move the knee too much. Can you feel that? Mm-hmm. That feels really good. Good. I think those exercises will help you a lot. Give them a try. This segment deals with Barbara Grosso, licensed massage therapist affiliated with Dr. Neil Meyerowitz as she massages Julie Rosenberg's upper back.
I'm in the process of massaging Julie's upper back. The major muscle of the upper back is the trapezius muscle, which is attached to the spine through the nuchal ligament. And it's one of its primary functions is to hold the head up and back. People who chronically carry their head forward as though the weight of the world were on their shoulders seem to have a continuous discomfort in this area. Correcting posture is a big help in relieving the problem, and massage also is very, very effective in dealing with it. The typical way that therapists deal with massage in the upper back is through long, firm stroking motions, and rocking manipulation, and deep trigger point thumb work. This manipulation of the upper back, as with most forms of massage therapy, is therapeutic, pleasant, and very relaxing. Get your pencils ready because here's what's happening in dance around the state. On February 7th, Miami, the Dance Parade will appear at the Low Art Museum, the University of Miami. Austin and Tab Dance Theater will appear February 8th at the Sun City Center in Tampa at the Kings Point Auditorium. The West Palm Beach Auditorium will host Miami City Ballet on February 9th and 10th. Blue Dance Parade performs again in Boca Raton on February 10th and 11th at the Ford Atlantic University Winter Carnival, FAU campus. Miami Beach, the Colony Theater, will be the scene of Ballet Flamenco La Rosa on February 10th and 11th. Susan Taylor and Friends perform Sea Spell on February 11th in uh, Tampa at the Tampa Museum of Art. In Tampa again on February 11th, the University of South Florida Department of Dance presents their program. February 13th, Sankafa, the Dance Champions of Africa, will perform at Miami-Dade Community College, Gusman Center for the Performing Arts. Okay. On February 15th through the 18th in Tampa, the Tampa Ballet appears at the Tampa Bay Performing Arts Center. The Avenale American Dance Theater performs February 16th in Melbourne at the Maxwell King Center for the Performing Arts. Judith Jameson, former star of Alvin Ailey, appears at West Palm Beach February 16th and 17th the Jameson Project, Duncan Theater, Palm Beach Community College. Alan Ailey performs again in Gainesville on February 17th at the University of Florida University Auditorium. Fort Lauderdale is the scene for the Cincinnati Ballet, February 17th and 18th at Bailey Concert Hall. Mikhail Baryshnikov, what can I say? If you enjoy his dancing as much as I do, you'll love this next segment where he's doing Twyla Tharp's choreography. Great artist.
that's Inside Florida Dance for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell your friends about us. We'll be here next week, and we hope you will be too. Welcome to another edition of Inside Florida Dance, coming to you today from Philip Michael Thomas's Miami Way Theater in North Miami. Vaughn, we've got a really great show today for our audience. First, we're going to take you inside a ballet class, which is common to all dancers. We have a very interesting interview today with a lady on the cutting edge of dance, Mary Luft. The yeah, costume mistress of the Miami City Ballet, Ida Morales, is going to take, in, take us into her costume shop. We go center stage with Julie Rosenberg. Our health segment will feature massage, chiropractic, and rehabilitation therapy. We'll talk about the Florida dance calendar. And we have a lovely pas de deux from Peter Martins and Suzanne Farrell. Tammy, you were right. This is a great show. I know. Stay with us for another edition of Inside Florida Dance. We will. may drop your kids off at ballet class, but you never stay around to see what happens. Here's what goes on inside. The second thing that happens in a ballet class, or second exercise, is called tendu. Tendu means to stretch. To stretch what? To stretch the instep. If you watch these girls here, what they're doing right now is they are stretching the instep of the foot, also strengthening the bottom portion of the foot, which is called the arch. A dancer must have a well-developed foot in order to dance. What we'll see now is a regular tendu. Can you just do two tendus front, ladies? One and two. And those are very, very smooth. Thank you. Now we're going to do battement tendu. Battement tendu has a beating action to beat out and to beat in. Go and beat and close and beat and close and beat and close and change. Show me second and beat and close. Beat and head. Beat and close and beat and close. Take the arabesque. Two and three e and four or and one and two, two and two, three and two and rest. Good. The next way that you would do a tendu is this was battement tendu on the ground. We say battement tendu à terre. If I was to say battement tendu dégagé, that would mean disengage from the floor. Watch what this looks like. Four, one, two, three, four and a one and two. And three, nice and even. Four and one, don't throw it. Two and three and four. Use the arm, the head, and reach. Reach long, strengthen and stretch the foot. One and two and three and four and. Next version of a tendu would be jeté. Jeté means to throw. Watch the action of the foot as you throw the tendu out, still in dégagé fashion. Five, six, seven. Throw, one, and throw, and three, and four, and go, and side, and two. Depending on what the choreographer wants, when they're doing choreography, we determine how fast the foot has to be used. It's necessary to do tendus at all speeds, and at one time or another in a class you will. The last kind of tendu, I would say, is battement tendu pique. Let's just do four with the pique, pique to perch, to prick the ground. Five, six, 
seven and dégagé and pique and the close dégagé and pique and the close dégagé pique and close dégagé and pick it then a close side pick and close four 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 reach away with the foot and arm long two three four one two three four last time side and one two three four two two three four three two three four four two three and finish that concludes the bat monton do exercise thank you boy that looks like hard work how do they make it look so easy but that's the way it works the harder you work the easier it looks for the little ones out there there's a very interesting book that's been put together by little rock productions learning ballet with lizzie bear it's a coloring book you can get it free it has all the different positions and terminology just keep watching the show at the end we will put the phone number that you can call, it's an 800 number. Here's someone who didn't need a coloring book, but has worked plenty hard. Dancer, choreographer, producer, Mary Luft. Mary Luft has been presenting and producing major dance acts in town for a long time through her company, Tiger Tail Productions. Mary, how long have you been doing this? We're going into our 10th year. And we just started, started this month in January. And we have events coming up in February, March, and April, May, and then I'm going to South America to get projects ready for a project in Rio in August. You'll be presenting in Rio? Yes, we'll be presenting in Rio. How large a facility? Do you want to come? There? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're presenting in a number of locations. We're working with organizations in Rio, and they are part of the project, uh, working at the Contemporary Museum with the Opera Company, with... Uh, art museums in Rio. How oh, interesting. Was that part of your visit there last summer? I know you were in some, you um, had a grant and... We've been going to South America for four years and it came through New Music America. It was a project for that festival where we brought 28 artists to the United States for the festival, but we have been going there. I set a piece on a company in Salvador last summer and uh, we're going back again this year. Mary, how did you get started? Were you a dancer? Yes, I was a dancer originally. Started very, very young. Are you still a dancer? Uh, social dancing only. <laughs> uh, you have to train and you have to do it every day if you're going to stay in shape. And, and I'm certainly not doing that now. You are a choreographer also? Yes, I'm a choreographer. And how long were you uh, training when you were a little girl to be a professional dancer? Or That was always my goal. That's the only thing I wanted to do was to go into dance. How long have you how long have you been here in Miami? I've been here since 1970. Came down uh, not with the idea to be involved in the arts. Uh, I came here just to live. And in 1974, Fusion Dance Company was beginning. And I got started with that company, with Wally Lord, who was starting a professional company at that time. So that was the beginning. Tell us some of the people who you're presenting this year. This year, we just had Celeste Miller and Charles Dennis. I saw them. They were two, oh, two very exciting performance artists out of New York. And I have Clyde Morgan coming, who's an ex Lamone dancer that's been doing uh, African work for about the last 15 years. And he'll be here with a number of percussionists. And then we're doing a truck piece that's going to travel around Florida with two Brazilians for two weeks around Florida. In uh, April, the Subtropics Music Festival, which is being done with the South Florida Composers Alliance. And it's a mini New Music America with all sorts of uh, new music, uh, computer music, acoustic music, uh, solo singers, uh, some real interesting people coming for that. And then I'm bringing in Tim Miller, who is a performance artist out of Las uh, Los Angeles that's performed at BAM and traveled throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the, uh, the kinds of uh, entertainment that you present? We're in an area, or? yes, we're in the leading edge. We're in the, the edge of art that's pushing the art form forward. We're in uh, the, dealing with artists that uh, later on you'll look back and say, oh yes, you know, and they become the classic forms, many of them. Uh, these are the people like uh, the Martha Grahams, the Cunninghams. Uh, not that every artist is one of those great individuals, but we're in that area that's developing the form. That's very interesting. So you may not know about these artists now, but in a number of years, these are the ones that win the Guggenheims, mm -hmm. the ones that win the Bessies, uh, and all the people that we have brought. Uh, so that's what you look for. You look for, you go all over the world. I look for people that are doing exciting new work, 
and uh, I'm not interested in whether they have a name or not. I'm just looking at the work. Tell us where you're performing, uh, where you're presenting this year. This season, all of our events are being presented at the Manuel Artime. It's a new theater. It's actually an old church, but a beautiful renovation done by Elizabeth Platter Zyberg and Andrew Stewani. It's a 750-seat theater in the heart of Little Havana. Uh, we use the stage in a very unusual way for the first time where the audience was on the stage, but you can use it for very large works as well. It's a huge stage, uh, very well equipped. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Owen, I had a great opportunity this afternoon to interview Ida Morales, who's the costume designer for the Miami City Ballet. And what she creates in her shop is just wonderful. Ida, you have such beautiful costumes on stage. How do they all get started? Oh, um, usually our artistic director, Edward Villela, comes to me with an idea, like this ballet called Booger Coup. It's beautiful. It's um, a tutu that uh, is not one of our traditionals because the tutu usually has many layers, but this one has only four layers besides the plate. It's all made out of raw silk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll show you another one here. This is a more traditional tutu. This is for Tarantella. It has its 13 layers with the knickers, and it has a yoke and a bodice, which is built comfortably for the dancer to this perform. This is for the individual dancer there. This they're... is for the individual dancer. In other words, yes. it doesn't fit everyone, it just fits one dancer. No, sometimes they do share, but usually it's built for the individual dancer. Also, I designed also for Jimmy Gamone de los Ceros, our resident choreographer. He, this particular piece is called Miniatures. And uh, this is another type of tutu. It's more modern. It's like a disc made out of horse hair. And uh, it's our next piece to be performed. And this came yeah. from uh, an idea? And this is my own idea, mm -hmm. my own creation. This is really beautiful. Ide, how did you come to be with Miami City Ballet? What brought you here? I was invited by uh, Edward Villola to come and build a ballet called El Amor Brujo. Mm -hmm. And Edward saw my work, was very pleased with it, and asked me to stay with the company. And what's your background? I mean, like, how were you trained to do all of this? I worked in New York with the uh, uh, director of the Korinska shop. Her name is Barbara Matera. I worked with her and I learned a lot about dance costume. Also, having the opportunity to go to New York and study the different ballets, uh, like Scotch Symphony, Booger Coup, Tarantella, which is our all original Karinska Balanchine pieces. And I studied the costume and the construction, and uh, I uh, had them built for the company. Thank you, Ida, for being with us this afternoon and showing us a behind-the-scenes look at costume construction. Each week on Center Stage, we focus on the up-and-coming dancers in South Florida. This week, it's Julie Rosenberg. Hi, my name is Julie Rosenberg, and I've been dancing since I'm about five years old. I'm a ballet dancer. And I guess the way that I got started in ballet is that my mom and I used to play around in the living room and say, oh, we're going to pick up the flowers and throw them in the air. And from there, I followed the natural course, which most young dancers do, of going to ballet academy. And um, around when I was 12 years old, it was the first summer that I went away for an intensive training course to San Francisco Ballet. I've also been to Houston Ballet. I've been to the Cleveland Ballet. Um, I suppose the most exciting thing that I did was going to the Boston Ballet. I was part of Boston Ballet, too, their ensemble there. And we did touring throughout the Northeast, uh, all the little um, states up there did performances. And then in the second half of my year with Boston, I also got to dance with the company, doing their Nutcracker and ballets with the company. Uh, I'm also a member of Ballet Theater of Miami, and I dance with them in their performances. And I teach little girls ballet, the five, six, seven-year-olds, and I also teach the older levels. And that's what I do. Dance is a really demanding art form, Owen, and it takes a lot of upkeep, for want of a better word. So we've included in our health segment three different ways to rehabilitate the body. Barbara Grosso is a licensed massage therapist affiliated with the Meyerowitz Chiropractic Center. She will massage Julie's lower back.
today I'm working with Julie's lower back. I hear more complaints about this area of the body than any other. The problems in this area can arise from many causes. Uh, lumbardosis, which is also known as sway back, the very rapid changes that result from pregnancy, but also something as simple as the imbalance caused by a beer belly. Trigger point massage, working with areas where tension seems to accumulate, is very effective for the lower back. And not surprisingly, one of, some of the trigger points are found along the line that you naturally rub when your back hurts, and that's the posterior area of the belt line. You also will find trigger points running down the outside seam at the hip where your jean seam is, and also in the fish-shaped bone right along its border that's known as the sacrum. It's a triangular bone at the base of your spine. Massage in these areas has a very beneficial effect, and as with most massage therapy, it's relaxing, feels good, and is very, very comfortable. Ankle injuries are common among ballet dancers and modern dancers, so Don Rocco, certified athletic trainer with the Health South Miami Rehabilitation Institute, shows Lisette Piedro some exercises for the ankle. Okay, Lizette, I think what we need to do is some strengthening exercises, more functional though. We're gonna begin with some exercises for the calf, okay? I'd like you to swing around and step onto the floor. And what I want you to start with is some toe raises. Okay, nice and easy on one foot. I want you to go up, all the way up and down. Excellent. You're gonna do that as many times as you feel comfortable. Probably start out with 10 or 15 and increase it. Switch to the other foot just so you see how it feels. Very good. Now you're going to do some toe walking. You're going to go up on your toes, and you're just going to walk around in a circle or up and down. I don't care how you do it. Excellent. Very good. And increase your time that you spend doing your toe walking. Should Begin. I be keeping my knee straight or bent? Fairly straight. Very good. Excellent. Okay, now you're going to do some jumping, okay? And I'd like you to start out with both feet. Jump nice and easy, and then you're going to increase the height and the time that you, there you go. Slowly increase. Excellent. Good. Now let's go to one foot at a time. This is a little bit higher level, okay? Very good. And switch feet so you can see how that feels. Okay. That looks good. All right. How did that feel to you? Great. Good. That looked really good. Dr. Neil Marwitz is going to tell us how chiropractic can help the dancer. What do you do if you've sustained an injury and you're unable to get to your doctor's office immediately? It is at this point that acute injury treatment should be initiated. This can be easily remembered with the following mnemonic device, RICE, or R-I-C-E, which stands for Rest, Ice, Compression, and Elevation. Beginning with R for rest, logically we need to rest the injured part. Ice, we want to use an ice pack and apply it to the injured part for 20 minute intervals or until numbness is achieved. C stands for compression and we're going to utilize an elastic or ACE bench to compress the injured part to again help reduce inflammation and swelling and provide support to a weakened area. And E for elevation, we're going to utilize a roll and elevate the area above the level of the heart to again reduce inflammation and swelling. Remember, contact your doctor so you can further evaluate the extent of the injury. Get your pencils ready because here's what's happening in dance around the state. On February 16th through the 17th, Judith Jamison and the Jamison Project perform in West Palm Beach. On February 17th, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, University of Florida in Gainesville. On February 17th through the 18th, the Cincinnati Ballet performs Cinderella at Bailey Concert Hall in Fort Lauderdale. On February 18th, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater is in Fort Myers. On February 18th, an evening with the arts, an extraordinary evening featuring some of the best of South Florida's performing arts community, including Miami City Ballet, Greater Miami Opera, Philharmonic Orchestra of Florida, and the New World Symphony, performs in Miami. On February 19th and 20th, Miami City Ballet is at the Naples Philharmonic Center for the Performing Arts in Naples. February 19th through the 20th, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater in Sarasota. On February 20th, West Side Story is performed with choreography by Jerome Robbins at the Ruth Eckert Hall in Clearwater. February 21st, West Side Story is performed at the Barbara B. Mann Performing Arts Hall in Fort Myers. February 22nd, Dance Alive, Winmore Recital Hall, Coconut Creek. 
February 22nd, West Side Story with choreography by Jerome Robbins is performed at the Van Wetzel Performing Hall in Sarasota. February 23rd and 24th, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Ruth Eckert Hall, Clearwater. February 23rd to 24th, Afro-American dancer Clyde Morgan is presented by Mary Lufton Company uh, in Miami. February 23rd and 24th, Southern Ballet Theater will appear at the Bob Carr Performing Arts Center in Orlando. Our Dance TV segment brings you the finest dancers from around the world. This segment, which is Pas de Deux, is between Peter Martins and Suzanne Farrell, principal dancers with New York City Ballet. Something very interesting about this, Tammy. Little did Peter Martins know that soon after he made this film, that George Balanchine would pass away and that he would take over as artistic director of New York City Ballet. And he's still the director today. He said, hey, he's got to be able to do something more than that. You know, this is dull, boring, and not very interesting. Let's see something else, something different. Not necessarily something better, just something different. You know, and I realized immediately that, that, hey, wait a minute, this man is really something else. He's sophisticated in one way and uh, demanding and uh, all sorts of things wrapped into one person. And he intrigued me more than anything. And I wanted to please him. I wanted to be able to do the things that he, he said that I couldn't do.
That was a beautiful demonstration by Peter and Suzanne, but everything they do is beautiful. It was very difficult, too. What made it difficult? Well, because pas de deux is a dance between two people, and you have another person to worry about who may be tired or uh, maybe they've had a bad day, so it adds to your problems. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. We want to thank you very much for joining us this week. Tell people about us. See you next week on... Inside Florida Dance. Welcome to another edition of Inside Florida Dance, coming from Philip Michael Thomas's Miami Way Theater in North Miami. Today we're going to start off with a ballet class taught by Tony Catanzaro. We have an interesting interview with the very capable company manager of Ballet Randolph, Lynn Robertson. We'll explore stage makeup with Lizette Piedra, something every dancer needs to know. We go center stage with Sergio Neglia. Our health segment features massage, chiropractic, and rehabilitation therapy. We'll talk to you about the Florida dance calendar. And Dance TV features Alvin Ailey, uh, which will be in South Florida next week. Stay with us for another edition of Inside Florida Dance. We've really learned a lot from our dance class sections. So far, we've learned plié, dégagé, tendu, and I can't wait to find out what's in store for us today. Our next exercises are a combination of two exercises. The first one will be a rond de jambe. Rond de jambe meaning circle of the leg. When we use it, we use it in a half circle. The exercise will also be done a terre. As I mentioned before, a terre means on the ground and the fondue put together. Fondue means to melt. We don't only want to melt down into our plie, but we also want to harden and straighten the legs as we rise. And these exercises are one used to open the hip socket and loosen the hip socket, and the fondue portion to stretch and strengthen the legs at the same time. Now you will see a rond de jambe exercise with fondue. Music, please. From the coup de pied, coup de pied, plié, and second. Rond de jambe, one. See, the circle of the leg is just in a half circle fashion. Up. This is the fondue to melt and straighten and slow tendue hold, a little slower. One, try to really develop to the maximum and lower slowly. And four. This does fondue, deep melting of the legs and strengthening up and tendue. And one, two. And this is only to the tendue as they stop. Now the second position, one, take the leg way up, knee up, knee up, up. Good. I can get my leg higher than that, but I'm wearing pants. Two and three and, and stop. A deep form do and lift the leg up, up, 
up and tendu and close. Rest, thank you. Lower the arms, good. What we'd like to show you is, we've showed you just what a fondue is like just on a flat level. Can you give me a nice deep fondue and releve, which means to rise up, and do fondue to the front and releve up and try to balance in that position and hold it securely. Close fifth and down. That is difficult, that's to, to the front, which is en avant. Give me a fondue développé à la seconde en balance, arms going fifth high. Each of these are French terms. They all understand what I'm saying. Usually I don't have to, in fact, demonstrate unless it's 100% necessary when teaching something new. And close. Julie, would you please show me arabesque? And from do all the way, the arabesque, the leg has to be directly behind the back in a long, long line and balance. Close. Thank you. The rond de jambe, as we showed you before, we showed you a tear. Barbara, would you show us a rond de jambe dégagé, disengaged from the floor? Dégagé and around. Good. At 90 degrees, grand rond de jambe. One. You can do it together. And take it around. Go. One. Grand rond de jambe. And around. Good. And how about a rond de jambe en l'air, Allison? Just do rond de jambe. And circle. Circle and close. There are many different kinds of rond de jambes. They all are put together in classes. You'll be seeing more of these segments at a later time. Thank you, ladies. Take a break. Now we've learned fondue, rond de jambe. I always thought fondue was some kind of cheese dip. Well, see, if you visit Inside Florida Dance, you learn a lot. <laughs> and next we go to our interview with company manager of Ballet Randolph, Lynn Robertson. Who is Ballet Randolph, for those people out there that don't know? Well, of course, we think Ballet Randolph is the best dance company in the whole wide world. At the moment, Ballet Randolph is 15 wonderful dancers. Our artistic director, Randolph Parrott. Our associate director, Gerard Abbotts, who serves as a choreographer and a dancer. And myself, I'm company manager, and I do everything from writing grants to mopping Marley's. Really? Mm hmm truly, even in public. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start? We started actually in 1987. Uh, some of our founding dancers asked our, our director, Randolph Parrott, who is a Miami native, third generation. He was here um, coming home, and they asked him for choreography. The result of that was a piece called The Late Show that was shown at the Florida Dance Festival that year in 87. It knocked the socks off everyone that saw it. Uh, later, in March of 88, we decided to get really serious and form Ballet Randolph as a nonprofit corporation in the state of Florida. And we presented our first our world premiere premiere that May in the Colony Theater, and we sold out. I was there. You certainly were. It was pretty special, wasn't yeah, it? it? was very nice. I enjoyed it. What is your mission? Where do you go from here? Well, I think it, we're a company less than two years old, and I think we're doing very well on our mission. Our mission was primarily to offer all the local dancers, choreographers, even visual artists and composers. Miami is a rich, incredibly rich gumbo of talent, especially now for dance since New World School is here. People are coming from all over the world to dance at New World, to study at New World. But that, there's very little formal professional performance opportunity for those people. Our mission from the beginning was to present professional productions. We went out, we hired a theater, and we put on a show, just like Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. <laughs> and that's our mission. Um, we pride ourselves that our, the quality of our stagecraft is professional. We believe in lights, costumes, sets, all the trimmings, as well as technique and all the dancer things that our dancers do. Um, but we feel really good about that. We've created over about 30 original pieces since inception, and these works come from people right here. Our company has grown in number. 
our dancers have had this professional experience under their belt and many of them are at Juilliard right now or in New York dancing professionally because of the training that they got at Ballet Randolph and because the performance experience and those standing ovations gave them the confidence to go on. What kind of dancing do you we, put on? We, we really believe at Ballet Randolph our mission also was um, to create a company for the pleasure of audiences and dancers alike. Uh, we do modern ballet, which is very European. Our director, Randolph Parrott, was a principal dancer, a star of the National Ballet of Germany in Bonn. And when he was involved in that lengthy stint, he was involved in opera and theater, all the old traditional theater things and ballet things, as well as the cutting edge of all the new work in Germany. So our dance is lyrical, it's musical. We rarely have tutus and point shoes on stage. But our I've dancers, seen them. Yes, we're not, we're not bound in cement to any one genre. At Ballet Randolph, we're very flexible. And the dancers are challenged, and I think our audiences are challenged. We want uh, to present things that the audience is going to respond to, whether the audience is sad or happy or uplifted mm -hmm. or downcast. They're going to react to what we do. What was that Laurie Horn uh, said uh, comment? I love that quote. We thought that was so wonderful. I opened the paper that morning and just screamed with joy. Uh, she said we were the cheery sky blue stripe and the spectrum of Miami dance. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are. Um, we want to have a good time. When and where do you dance? Well, we dance at the beautiful Colony Theater, 1040 Lincoln Road, Miami Beach. It's a deco gym of a theater. It's perfect for dance. And since we began, we've presented nine performance seasons at the Colony. Upcoming in 1990, we have February 23rd, 24th, 25th, with three world premieres, including Randolph Parrott's Petrushka. And then we will ha conclude our, 19 our season for this year on Memorial Day weekend in May, May 25th, 26th, 27th. And we'll begin again in early September of 1990. We're really committed to presenting a regular season, and we love the colony. Um, the staff there has been nothing but good. Of course, we dance at a lot of other places. We routinely participate in community events like Cornucopia of the Arts. We opened the Miami Book Fair one year. We've okay, even danced at Club New. Stage makeup is a tool of the trade. In this segment, Lizette Piedra, a professional dancer, shows a young dancer, Adriana Gonzalez, how to apply eye makeup. To apply stage makeup, it's very complex. Uh, a professional could probably get their makeup on between 10 and 15 minutes, and someone who is just starting out to apply stage makeup, it could take them as long as a half an hour. Um, what you will be seeing in this segment is I will explain to you how we can make the eye appear larger, especially if the person's eyebrow is very close to their eyelid. We want to give space in between that eye to make the eye appear larger. So I will show you how blocking out your own eyebrow and painting a new one over it will make the appearance of a bigger eye. Adriana has a foundation applied to her face. She has uh, powder on, and it's a very base look right now. What I would like to explain to you is how we are going to make Adriana's eye appear larger to give the illusion of being a bigger eye by blocking out the end of her eyebrow and making a new one. This is done very easily by first saturating the end of her eyebrow and pressing hard on the skin with beeswax. Uh, if you don't have beeswax, uh, a chapstick is uh, just as good, and you make sure that you expand and press down so all of the little hairs are pressed flat against the face. The next 
thing that you have to have is a cover stick or cover up or erase and you make sure that you cover the end area which you will repaint with the cover up and then carefully take your thumb and start expanding and blending the cover stick. Always remembering when you blend to blend to the end. This area that you are covering up with the, with the uh, cover stick will eventually have shadow, eye shadow, whether it's beige or a white, whatever color, light color you choose to cover it with. The next thing to give her a new eyebrow is you start by painting away the front of her eyebrow, continuing the upward swing of her own eyebrow. And if we were going to give the illusion of an oriental or Chinese, we would continue this all the way up to the top so it is a straight line this way, straight line. But what I would like to show today is just regular eyebrow. So we're just going to block this out just a little bit and give her, this is the shape of her natural eyebrow. Extend and darken thick. Small lines are not seen on stage. We want to make sure that that goes all the way to the end. And always remember to finish with a very light point at the end. Do not finish with a thick line at the end of that eyebrow. Well, that's looking very, very good, Adriana. I think all we need to do is darken this up a little bit more. And we have it. Yes. That looks very good. We're ready for the eyeshadow. Like everything else in uh, dance, practice does make perfect. And the more you practice on yourself different techniques, you find that uh, you start learning what your eye really looks like and what are some of the tricks that makes your particular eye look better. Do you want an arched eyebrow? Do you want a pointier eyebrow, thicker, thinner? All of it is up to you. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and practice, practice, practice. I bet Adriana and the other girls, besides the dancing, just love to get involved with all of that makeup. Oh, sure, and with their parents' permission, too. <laughs> and now, center stage takes you to Sergio Neglia, professional dancer with Miami City Ballet. Hi, <laughs> I'm a member of Miami City Ballet since a year and a half ago. And just came with my wife, Heidi, since New York. Uh, this was two years ago, and uh, I just started working in this company because uh, I got a contract and I think it's a good company. And um, what else? I just started with school roles, and after six months, I started to do some solos in dance talks, and uh, it's just beginning now to do some principal roles to have a chance because we, we had pretty good uh, two male dancers, and it was very hard to go with, but now. Thank God we are going. And uh, I, I born in Argentina, Buenos Aires, and I start in the Theater Colón of Buenos Aires uh, at the age of eight. Uh, that was easy for me because my mother and father, they were dancers, so they, they teach me how to start with. Then we put me in that school, and then later on got a scholarship in uh, school, um, Bolshoi School in 1973. After that, I came to my country and started to do some guesting performance and they go uh, like into Europe to Prilos and get the medals there. And then I got a scholarship for a School of American Ballet, which was a great school and great beginning for myself because I was very young. And then I started to do some guest, so guest solos at the age of 17, 18. And then later on, you know, now I just came to Miami, which thank God I started to work with them because I couldn't find my visa, but then everything was just right, fine. This week's health section begins with Barbara Grosso, licensed massage therapist with the Myrowitz Chiropractic Clinic. She deals with the upper leg, the hamstrings.
Today I'm working with the muscle group called the hamstrings. It's in the back of the thigh. It's composed of three muscles, the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris. And this important muscle group is involved in running and jumping, and so people like runners and dancers give it a really good workout. Uh, maintenance of this muscle requires a very firm and committed stretching program, and this program works excellently in conjunction with massage. Another problem in this area is uh, sciatica, which is a burning pain down the back of the thigh. And the point pressure massage is very, very effective in relieving the symptoms of this problem. Manipulation of the hamstrings, as with many other massage treatments, is relaxing, beneficial, and feels wonderful. Don Rocco, certified athletic trainer with the Health South Miami Rehabilitation Institute, explains what BAPS is. Okay, Lizette, this is the BAPS board, okay? And as we do this exercise and as you get better at it, I'm going to increase the size of the ball underneath so that you get a little bit more range. But for now, I'd like you to put your foot up here on the foot. There you are. And you're going to be doing range of motion exercises, keeping your knee as still as possible, okay? Rotate it around. Good. I want you to try and touch the rim all the way. Very good. And I want you to try both directions. Try the other way. Good. Very good. Okay. And as we go, Lizette, I'm also going to increase the resistance, okay? And the way we do that is we add a weight. This is a two and a half pound weight. And as we get stronger, we'll add a little bit more and a little bit more. We'll place this on the pin. We can move that pin in different directions in order to strengthen different areas. Does that feel a little bit better? Well, the weight makes it a lot harder. OK. And as you get stronger, we'll increase the weight. This is an exercise you obviously can't do on your own. You need to go to a therapist where they have a BAPS board to work with. Okay, I think that's terrific. Dr. Neil Marwitz is going to tell us how chiropractic can help the dancer. I would like to discuss a specific chiropractic technique which I have found to be most effective in dealing with my dance patients. The technique is called activator methods and utilizes a system of body mechanics, neurological checks, and orthopedic checks in, in pinpointing areas of, invo of involvement along the spinal column. The technique utilizes a handheld instrument called an activator which delivers a light control thrust into the spine. We begin the technique by performing what is known as a leg check. And this helps us to determine the side of involvement or the side of imbalance. In this patient's case, we find an imbalance on the right side. So we begin adjusting at the feet and we gradually work our way up the body segmentally checking each area. We next ask the patient to put her right arm onto her lower back. And again, performing the leg check, we find an imbalance on the right side. So we move to the corresponding area and make the correction in the lower part of the patient's back. We then ask the patient to put her right arm on top of her head. Again, coming back to recheck the legs, we do not find any involvement here. The patient lowers her arm, turns her head to the right. Again, we don't find any involvement in the upper part of the back. With the head back in the center, Look up once and back down. A slight involvement in the cervical spine of the neck area. The correction is made, and this completes the technique. Get your pencils ready, because here's what's happening in dance around the state. On February 20th, West Side Story is performed with choreography by Jerome Robbins at the Ruth Eckert Hall in Clearwater. February 21st, West Side Story is performed at the Barbara B. Mann Performing Arts Hall in Fort Myers. February 22nd, Dance Alive, Winmore Recital Hall, Coconut Creek. February 22nd, West Side Story with choreography by Jerome Robbins is performed at the Van Wetzel Performing Hall in Sarasota. February 23rd and 24th, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Ruth Eckert Hall, Clearwater. February 23rd to 24th, Afro-American dancer Clyde Morgan is presented by Mary Lufton Company uh, in Miami. February 23rd and 24th, Southern Ballet Theater will appear at the Bob Carr Performing Arts Center in Orlando. February 23rd to the 24th, Smarter Than Dogs, a new performance work, 
uh, will be presented at the USF Fine Arts Theater in Tampa. February 23rd through 25th, Miami City Ballet at Valley Concert Hall in Fort Lauderdale. On February 23rd to the 25th, Valley Randolph will present Petrushka at the Colony Theater in Miami Beach. On February 23rd through the 25th, Udanskarade, Artie Gras Festival, will appear at the Gardens Mall on PGA Boulevard in Palm Beach Gardens. Dance TV takes you to Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. We see Revelations, which is the company's signature piece, which Ailey created in 1960 from his recollections as a youth growing up in rural Texas. You'll have an opportunity to see the company when it's here in South Florida next week. And remember, you'll have an opportunity to see us again next week. Please watch. On Inside Florida Dance.
Welcome to another edition of Inside Florida Dance. Today coming to you from Philip Michael Thomas's Miami Way Theater in North Miami. As every dancer does, we'll start off our program with a daily ballet class. We have an interview with a man whose career has touched seven decades, Tommy Armour. We'll show you how dancers get their hair up in buns. We go center stage with Allison Hesch. Our health segment features massage, chiropractic, and rehabilitation therapy. And our dance TV segment features one of the greatest male dancers of all time, Fernando Bajonis. Stay with us. We've got a great show on Inside Florida Dance. In today's class with Tony, we will learn more steps and more French. Our next exercise is called the frappe. The frappe means to strike, to strike at the floor in a certain way, utilizing the foot by hitting the ball of the foot first and then fully extending the toes and the leg at the same time. What I'd like to do this time is first show you what a frappe exercise looks like. We're going to combine the frappe with petit patement. Petit patement meaning little beats, little beats done around the ankle. Can I have some music, please? Preparation and striking with the ball of the foot strong and straight and exercising the tendu action, which strengthens and stretches the instep. One, two, three, petit patement. And beat, 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 two, three, four. Five, six, and down on seven. En quoi. One, en quoi, meaning in all directions, which is the sign of the cross. We say to the front and side and back and side. Close and plie. Good, good. Now I'd like to show you slowly, because it's hard for the eye to see this. They say that the uh, main preparation is to tendu to the side. We showed you this before, tendu means to stretch. Now point your foot at the coup de pied position. Coup de pied position means neck of the foot in French. Neck of the foot, long expression for really pointing your foot at your ankle, but we call this the neck of the foot or ankle. Now strike the ground slowly so the audience can see the ball and then lengthening out and return. And point and in. There's another position that the frappe is done from, and that's the sur le coup de pied. Sur le coup de pied meaning surrounding or wrapped around the neck of the foot. Can you show me sur le coup de pied? Strike three times very quick to the front. And one and two and three to the side. And one and two and three. Good. Allison, can you show me the petit patement, but rise right up on the half point first and show the little beats around the ankles. And beat, 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 and out again. And beat, beat, faster, 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 and, and out. This also aids in the doubles when we do the double frappes. Can you show me double front, double side, and petit patement? Ready? Preparation, and in, and. Double front, double side, and petit patement. Thank you. Okay. As you see, different choreographers, different teachers have different speeds that the foot has to move at. And the frappe exercise and the petit patement are in fact the best exercises for speed and use of the foot. Thank you, ladies. Rest. Petit what? Patement and frappe. Frappe. I thought frappe was like an ice cream sundae. And kids love ice cream. And they'll love this coloring book put out by Little Rock Productions. It's learning ballet with Lizzie Bear. It has positions and terminology, and it's very interesting. And you can get your copy free. Just keep watching the show, and you'll find out how. And speaking of teaching ballet, you interviewed Tommy Armour. He's been in the Miami area for many, many years and taught thousands of children. It's no great secret that last year, Tommy Armour was honored with a gala that celebrated his 80th birthday. He has a career that started in the 1930s, and he has trained many, many dancers that are with just about every major professional company in the United States and Europe today. 
Tom, what kind of thrill do you get when you go to a performance and you see some of your former students like Marsha Sussman or Sally Ann Isaacs? It's a great thrill, of course, to see them when you had them when they were so young as students and to see them now performing as professional dancers. How old were they when, they, when you first saw them? Do you remember? Hmm. Marsha? Eight or nine, somewhere along in there. Sally about the same? Oh, yes. That's very, very young. A lot of dancers that you have trained professionally have gone on to professional companies all over the United States and Europe. Did you ever consider forming your own professional company? No, that has never been my consideration because the reason I started the Miami Ballet back in 1951 was for students who were talented like Sally Ann and Marsha and they had no uh, place to perform here. We didn't have a company then. So I started the company just as an outlet for these young dancers. So you never said to yourself, hey, I want to form another American Ballet Theater no. or a New York City Ballet, and now what, what uh, Edward Valella and his organization have done here in town. That was never on your mind. No, not at all. It, I used it as a training ground, actually. They learned uh, ballets. They learned uh, stage deportment. and. Uh, makeup, all that sort of thing, so that when they did get a chance to go into a professional company, they were prepared for it. And uh, when the Miami City Ballet started here with Eddie, I was all for it and, and uh, spoke out for it from the very beginning, because we also had grown to the level where we needed a professional company here. But I still wanted the Miami Ballet to go on as a training company. Well, it struck me that you have put, there are so many people that have trained through you, dozens and dozens, you and Martha Moore, and the Miami Ballet Company, that, uh, that you could have easily created a fabulous company, but I understand that it, it wasn't your thing. Tell us how you started here in Miami. I came here in uh, 1949 uh, to take over a studio because the owner was being, uh, her husband had been transferred. Her name was Hildegard Bennett. She had a, a very good school, and she had studied with teachers in Philadelphia who had studied with the same teachers I studied with in Paris. So her pupils were trained exactly the way I would have trained them, so that I had advanced dancers right from the beginning when I came here. And that first school was on Miami Beach? On Miami Beach. On and you're in South Miami now? Right. Did you go right from Miami Beach to South Miami? No, I took it in stages. I moved over to Biscayne Boulevard, then I added a studio out on Coral Way, and the people kept moving farther southwest, so I took up and moved out to South Miami. I bought a building out there, and I've been there ever since. There's an organization that I know that uh, you are part of, CERBA. Yes, which is the Southeastern Regional Ballet Festival. Yes, and you're one of the founding members of that association? That's right, the Miami Ballet Company is a founding member. It started back in uh, 1956 in Atlanta. And uh, at that first performance, I think five companies performed uh, at the theater there. And uh, the following year, uh, the company, our performance was so successful in that we were invited to go up to Jacob's Pillow. Ted mm -hmm. Sean invited us up there in 57. A few years later, uh, let's see, what was the next company? The, uh, Southeastern, we were the Southeastern, the Northeastern, I think, was next, then the Southwest and the West and that sort of thing, until it became a national organization. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting aspect mm. to these, these competitions where I guess the kids can, can challenge themselves for prizes well, and things like well, that. Well, the advantage of it is, you see, it, uh, they have a lot of teachers that they bring in from around the country that are uh, well known in their mm -hmm. profession, leaders in ballet in other words, so that the, the dancers get to study with these teachers, they get to perform for the audiences that are there in the ballets that we have them trained in, and it's a competition in a way, because the best companies get to dance on Saturday night at a gala performance. I see. How many productions do you stage in a year? We only put on two major productions a year, Nutcracker in December, and uh, then a spring performance. And you canceled the spring this year because we of We canceled Serba? it because of Serba. The dates overlap. We decided that it was better for them to go to the Serba than to just do a performance here. Tom, I think the audience would be fascinated to know a little bit about your background, your start in ballet. I know very few people would believe how old you are. We won't tell them. <laughs> but tell us about your, where it all started, your first professional job. 
And my first professional job was in Paris because I had gone there to study with some Russian teachers. And uh, one day my teacher said, would you like to audition for the Edith Rubenstein Ballet? I said, of course, that's what I've been training for. So I went over, auditioned that day, was accepted. And uh, the company only la lasted about six months. And that was in the 1930s? That was 34. And then you went with Madame Nijinska, Nijinsky's yes. brother, uh, uh, sister? Sister, yes. Madame Nijinska. And went with Madame Nijinska, who was Nijinsky's sister. That's right. And uh, I was with her for her, that season. And then I joined the uh, uh, Leon Bachakovsky Ballet Russe and uh, toured Europe for several years. We went to Australia and New Zealand. That isn't the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. No. Uh, this was... that, I, I joined the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo when I came back to the States uh, at the start of the war in 1939. And you were born here in the United States? I was born in Tarquin Springs, which is over on near Tampa. Coast, on the West Coast, yes. I'll be done. And you took mm -hmm. ballet training there? Uh, in Tampa. There? In Tampa. I studied with uh, a teacher there in Paris, in uh, Tampa. And uh, after about six years of training with her, she took me over to Paris to study with these Russian teachers. Oh, That's how I started, you. yes. Oh, I right. Very interesting. Well, well I became a member of the family, actually. Uh -huh. That's a fabulous career that you had. Uh -huh. And I want to thank you for taking the time and share some time with us and our audience. I'm happy to do it. Thank you for inviting me. He's simply amazing, Owen. I agree. In our next segment, something that has always fascinated me is how girls with long hair can manage to make it disappear almost by placing it up into a bun. What I will be showing you here today is a classical bun and our model Barbara has very very thick hair so it's a little harder to put your hair up in the classical bun. Um, you, the dancers that are out there seeing the program will see that I'm doing a little bit different than maybe you're used to seeing. And the reason that I am doing this is because I would like you to see that I am trying something new on Barbara because she does have such thick hair. Some people like to apply the spray after they are finished. I like to apply the spray before I start, especially in the front. We want to make sure that always, always, always we leave the hair nice and slicked back so there are no bumps. Make sure that it is nice and slicked back. Depending on the dancer's height, you can really do a lot of visuals making yourself appear taller by when you first put the rubber band in your hair, not to put the rubber band too low. Make the rubber band higher so your bun is higher and when you see the person from the front, the bun will make you appear taller. Again, make sure that the hair is nice and slicked back with no bumps. Now that it is nice and slicked back, we are going to take the rubber band and tie it around Barbara's hair. She has very, very thick hair. Again, some of you that have thinner hair will probably find that you will have the rubber band go around two times. Some people have the rubber band go around three times. At this point, I am going to make sure that I spray Barbara's hair again, all of those little flyaway hairs that we do not want to show. I will be showing you a back angle in a second, but I just want you to know that the front is very, very important. So, now that we have our front nice and slicked back, I am going to turn Barbara around. Barbara's hair, again, I want to remind you, is very, very full. And what I like to do with full hair is almost that I do a double bun. I part the hair in the middle, and I start only with one section of the hair. Make sure that you twist it very tight. The tighter you twist, the cleaner the bun will appear. Twist the hair around and around very, very tight. Go under the second half of the hair. Very tight. Once that end is almost disappeared, you will join that end with the second piece and again start twisting. Now, 
you keep twisting and pinning. If you notice, I'm using hairpins that we call them old, la old lady hairpins only because they are not bobby pins. They are not bobby pins. Those hair, that hairpin has got to be taken by taking a little bit of the hair and tucking under. That's very important that the hairpin is placed in the proper position. Grab hair and tuck under. If the bobby pin is not placed in the correct position, it will fly away and probably land someplace where you don't want it to land. Always grab hair and tuck under. The final section of having very nice, a very nice classical bun is that you must have a hairnet. The hairnet should be as close to your natural color as possible. If you have black hair, do not get brown. Make sure that you wrap it around a few times and then, of course, respray the bottom area. You see how there's wisps in the bottom area? Respray the bottom area. I'm using spray. There are some dancers that like gel. Either one works beautifully. Again, if these ha little hairs that you have on the bottom are very thick, you might want to also use a bobby pin to be placed under here so those little hairs do not fly away. This bobby pin will be hidden by one more hairpin that is attached and pushed under. Now we have a very flat bun. Again, I'm going to turn Barbara to the front. I will show you that you can see her hair slightly coming up from the top. And if you see the side angle, it makes her head appear very angular. Barbara not only has beautiful hair, but she's a beautiful dancer as well. As is our policy on center stage, we focus on young up-and-coming dancers in South Florida. On today's show, we visit with Allison Hesch. Hi, my name is Allison Hesch. I'm a talented dance student at South Miami Middle School. I've been dancing since I was about seven years old. And I got started when my mom took me to my first ballet class. And she, she told me that I was going to take ballet. And I went in, and I knew from the minute I first put on my ballet shoes I wanted to be a dancer. I study at Ballet Academy Miami under the direction of Tony Catanzaro and Lizette Piedra. I'm in their company, Ballet Theater of Miami. I do many performances with them. And for the past two years, I've been going away summer. Well, more than that. For the past two years, I've been going to Joffrey Ballet School under scholarship. And the year before that, I went to Houston Ballet. And the year before that, I went to Milwaukee. So I've been going away since I was 10. And it's wonderful to go away because you get a lot of teachers who can help you and you get a lot of experience from all the teachers and the competition with a lot of girls your same age and it's really an experience to go away. Um, I've been here for five years and I do, I take class every night and on Saturdays and when there's rehearsals every single day and it's great here. Um, Mikhail Vershnikov, as you know, has a new perfume out and I went there with a picture that I had gotten at, at an, an old bookstore and I wanted to have him autograph it. So I went there and I was, there was a humongous line and I was really nervous. I felt like I wanted to cry because he's so famous and everything. And I went there and he signed my picture and I actually got to shake his hand and it was thrill and it was great. Regular viewers on Inside Florida Dance know that Owen and I try to present different methods of physical therapy. Barbara Grosso, licensed massage therapist affiliated with the Myrowitz Chiropractic Clinic, will massage Julie's hand and wrist. I'm in the process of massaging Julie's hand and wrist. This is one of the most active and also one of the most graceful areas of the body. And in the seemingly small area, we have 27 bones and all of the muscles attaching them. There's a school of thought known as reflexology that teaches that in this area, 
points can be found that relate to all of the organs of the body. And so massage in this area can, in effect, stimulate or relax the entire body. One of the wonderful things about your hand and wrist is that it's so easily accessible. Anyone is able to massage it, and with just a few professional treatments, it's easy to learn how to maintain this area on your own. Manipulation of the hand and the wrist, as with most forms of massage, is pleasant, beneficial, and very, very relaxing. Knee injuries are a common problem among dancers. Don Rocco, certified athletic trainer with Health South Miami Rehabilitation Institute, will show us some knee strengthening exercises. Okay, Lizette, these VMO exercises that we're teaching you are specific for this vastus medialis oblique, or VMO muscle. This muscle becomes very weak in ballet dancers. They don't use that muscle very often. They spend a lot of time in that turnout position, okay, and it becomes very weak. One exercise I want you to use. I'm going to roll up a towel, and I'm going to put it underneath your knee, okay? With this exercise, your toe needs to come all the way back for me. Flex it back. Good. And all you're going to do is tighten up this muscle and straighten the knee. You're going to be kind of pushing down on that towel just a little bit. Can you feel that? Right. Good. I want you to do, oh, 50 to 100 of those a day, okay? You can't do too many. Good. Now, the next exercise, we're going to get a little bit higher here. We're going to roll up a coffee can, okay, and a towel, all right? And we're going to stick that up underneath your knee. Now, again, with this exercise, the toe comes all the way back, and all you're going to do is just straighten the knee, lift it up and tighten up, hold for about five seconds, and then relax. Good. Okay, Lizette, as you get better and better at this, I want you to add some weight to your ankle, okay? This is a two-pound weight. Begin with a one-pound and work your way up. That'll increase the strength of this muscle as you go on. Okay? How does that feel? Good. All right. Dr. Neil Myritz will show us several physical therapy modalities. I would like to discuss a number of physical therapy modalities which are utilized in, in this office in treating the dance-related injury. Firstly, electrical muscle stimulation. These pads are applied to the injured area with the use of Velcro straps. EMS introduces a safe electrical current into the body and facilitates he the healing process of muscles and ligaments. Next, we have hydroculator hot packs, which again are applied to the injured area and helps to promote hyperemia or increased blood flow to the injured part. Again, this facilitates the healing process. Next, we move to ultrasound, which is a deep heating type of therapy which again helps to reduce inflammation and swelling and also importantly breaks up any scar tissue that is formed in the ligament or the muscle. And lastly, I'm going to mention attended therapeutic massage which, will, which we will go into in greater detail in other segments. On our next segment that we call Dance TV, we feature Fernando Bujones. And Cynthia Gregory, the principal dancer with American Ballet Theater, has said he's the greatest male dancer in the world.
Did you realize that Fernando Bajones was born in Cuba and trained in Miami? No, I didn't. See, you learn something new every day on Inside Florida Dance. Please watch us again next week. Keep those cards and letters coming. But Tammy is spelt with an <laughs> E, not a Y, not an I, but an E. And she's very sensitive. <laughs>